Good afternoon, everybody. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to the first annual Green Court Distinguished Lecture. The Green Court Foundation has generously enabled NYU Shanghai to host an annual lecture in which a distinguished thinker is brought to our university to speak with us about a matter on which they are truly expert. Today, we will hear from the inaugural Green Court Distinguished Lecturer, Professor John E. Hopcroft. John is one of the most important theoretical computer scientists in history. His fundamental achievements in the design and analysis of computer algorithms and data structures won him the Turing Award, the highest distinction in the world of computer science as well as the IEEE Harry Good Memorial Award and the IEEE von Neumann Medal. He is a member of the National Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Engineering, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He served for six years on the National Science Board, which oversees the National Science Foundation. John is a legend at Cornell University, where he has taught for more than 50 years. He is renowned both for his own research and for his extraordinary commitment to teaching. Throughout his career, he has been deeply invested in teaching not only his graduate students, many of whom have had distinguished careers as innovative computer scientists, but just as importantly, his undergraduate students. He taught CS381, the uh, basic introduction to the theory of computing for many, many years. He was also an exceptionally popular department chair and dean in the College of Engineering. John is well known here in China, which has granted him the Friendship Award and named him a foreign member of the Chinese Academy of Sciences. He spends significant amounts of time each year at Shanghai Jiao Tong University where he created the Hopcroft Center for Computer Science, and also at Peking University, where he created the Center on Frontiers of Computing Studies. He has worked hard with the Ministry of Education on several innovative projects to enhance the importance of undergraduate teaching at Chinese universities. John's lecture today is entitled, Behind the Scenes of a University Education. After he speaks, we will have some time for Q&A. But before we hear from John, it is my honor to turn the podium over to our good friend, Frank Yao. Frank earned an MBA from the NYU Stern School of Business in 1998. He is the managing partner at Green Court Capital Management, and he is the person who had the vision to establish this invaluable lecture series. Please join me in welcoming Frank Yao to the podium. Thank you so much, John. Um, my current working areas is investment management, but computer science is the areas for my undergraduate and graduate studies back many years ago. When I was a CS student many years ago, John's two book, Design and Analysis of the Computer Algorithms and uh, Formal Language and Their Relations to Automata, serve as a textbook and also important reference book. So to some extent, John is, uh, is my teacher in books. Interestingly, when I went to Columbia University to pursue my PhD studies in computer science again, again many years ago, the department chair, Svi Gallier, actually is, is John PhD student. So to a large extent, the John is my teacher of the teachers, or teachers squares. So I don't know whether we have this word terms. And a couple days ago, two days ago, on Mondays, when I paid visit to John 
He is so energetic, also just right after the hospital, and uh, with all the intellectual curiosities, he, is great, he remains great teachers. After so many years, as you probably know, computer science has developed very quickly. To a large extent, I'm out of the dates in computer science. Sometimes I even could not uh, figure out my cell phones. I don't remember many details from the books, but the way of the thinkings I learned from that books remain powerful on my daily life and also my daily works. So to this extent, I think uh, that John is 100% teachers to my lives. And, uh, um, and uh, even, uh, equally importantly, is the way of the thinking, building up the way of the thinking, I think is probably one of the most important elements of the education, which is a today topic. On behalf of the Green Core Capital Management, I'd like to thank John for speaking at the first Green Core Distinguished lecture, uh, Lectures. And also, I'd like to thank Jeff and MRU Shanghai for hosting uh, lectures. Now I need to go back to CIS uh, to become the, uh, the students of the Jones in person. So this is quite a different from before. Thank you. Thank you all. Okay, I, I'm going to talk about many issues uh, involving education. Uh, how to be successful and have a good life, and what China is doing to improve education. I, I assume that some of my audience are uh, computer science students and would like part of my talk to be about computer science research. I assume others in the audience are non-researchers and would appreciate a, a talk for a general audience. I will divide my time uh, so that there will be content of interest uh, for both segments of the audience. I will start uh, with talking about the mission of a university. The real mission of a university is to educate students to have a good life. It's important to discover what students really enjoy so we can help them prepare for a good life. For this reason, including humanities and social science courses in science and engineering programs is important. Educating a student to get a job they enjoy is only a small part of uh, the university education. The mission of US universities and Chinese universities are different. To talk about the nature of US and Chinese university education, I first need to discuss basic and applied research. The terms basic and applied do not refer to how fundamental the research is, but rather to why someone is doing the research. Applied research is done to solve a specific problem. Basic research is research on an issue that someone is curious about. There need not be any application. Perhaps we should call basic research curiosity-driven research. Consider two researchers focused on the same research project. For one, it might be called applied research, and for the other, it might be called basic research. It simply matters on why they're doing it. After World War II, the US government realized the importance of research and created the National Science Foundation to fund basic research in universities. However, the foundation was not interested in the research per se, but rather on using research funding to improve science and engineering uh, education. Top US universities do not allow their faculty to seek applied research contracts. U.S. universities have set up independent organizations to carry out applied research for the government and industries. MIT created Lincoln Laboratories. 
In 1970, Stanford University created Stanford Research Laboratories. Uh, the only relationship between Stanford University and Stanford Research Institute is in their name. Applied research is unlikely to produce fundamentally new research directions, since it's focused on solving a specific problem. On the other hand, basic research goes off in all kinds of different directions, and sometimes creates a whole new area, which leads to new industries and millions of jobs. The funding of basic research in US universities was one of the best investments ever made. The mission of US universities and Chinese universities are different. The US has produced enough scientists and engineers, so if the government or a company needs some applied research done, they will hire the talent and carry out the research at a national laboratory or a company laboratory in a timely manner. Top US universities do not engage in applied research. They focus only on the education of the next generation of talent. Uh, the mission of top universities, uh, the mission of top universities does not include research, although it looks like they focus on research. I will explain this apparent contradiction in a few minutes. China has not yet produced sufficient engineering science and uh, talent for the needs of the nation. Thus, Chinese universities need to help the government and industries with applied research. For this reason, Chinese universities have two missions, produce the next generation of talent and help the government and industries with applied research. It's important not to let the portion of the mission to help with applied research interfere with the teaching mission of the university. Many university science and engineering departments are hiring researchers for faculty. This raises a question. If the mission of the university is to educate, why do departments in science and engineering focus on hiring researchers? The answer is actually quite simple. When a university hires a faculty member, they're hiring someone for a career of 40 or so years. They want someone who will grow with their field and 30 years from now will not be teaching material that is 30 years old. They want someone who, because they are curious, will observe how the world is changing and how that should change education. Thus, they are looking for two aspects of a potential faculty member. Is he curious and does he have lasting energy? If, if the faculty member is curious and a new direction appears in his field, he's likely to explore it and update his course. This will keep the faculty member teaching material that is new and up to date. Unfortunately, many recruiting committees look at the candidate's research and ask how fundamental is it. They look at how important the journals are that he publishes in. This is not appropriate, since one is not interested in the candidate's research, but in his curiosity. They should instead be asking, why did he pick the topics he has worked on, and how curious is he? Will he continue to explore as he gets older? If his advisor was working on a topic, and he just extended it, that's not good. If instead he says, says he was, a topic was interesting and he started working on it, but then another topic appeared more interesting and he switched his thesis topic and continued to explore various ideas, that is good. I would like to address the actual process of teaching and what is learned. What a faculty member is conveying is something far more important than the technical material he teaches in his course. If one asks a student 10 years after they graduated, what material did they learn in courses that they are using in their job? The answer usually is nothing. What one is teaching is how to think, solve problems, 
analyze issues, make decisions, predict consequences, uh, distinguish truth from fiction, be creative, communicate clearly, to learn, to explore, and many other high-level tasks. One does this indirectly when teaching the student the technical content of their course. For example, in elementary school, a teacher told me that if you divide one in integer by another, the result will be a terminating decimal or a repeating decimal. I think the teacher thought she was only giving me a fact, but I learned something far more important. I divided several integers and discovered why the result was either a terminating decimal or a repeating decimal, and I realized one could prove mathematical statements. Another teacher asked me how one would determine the area of a circle if the constant pi was not known. I divided the interior of the circle into small squares, counted the number of squares inside the circle, and obtained a lower bound on the area. I then realized that if I made the squares smaller, I could get a better lower bound. By repeating the process over and over, I could get as close approximation to the area as I wanted. What I learned is that there are approximations and the intuitive concept of a limit. I don't think the teacher was thinking about these ideas at all, uh, but was just looking for something to fill the class time. The concept of a limit helped me when I went to college and took the beginning calculus course. Many of the students in the course did not understand the precise mathematical definition of a limit. But I recognized the mathematical definition was a way of formalizing my intuitive notion of a limit. I mention these uh, two examples since they illustrate how one learns something important, some important high-level concepts, even though they are not formally taught. Uh, to improve university education, it's important to get the correct metrics for measuring the quality of university programs. One tends to get what they measure, so it's important that evaluation metrics reflect the mission of the institutions. The presidents of many top universities in China are trying to improve the international ranking of their institution. These rankings are based primarily on research funding and number of and quality of research papers. Neither of these metrics has anything to do with the mission to educate the next generation of talent. Clearly, the number of research papers and the amount of research funding are the wrong metrics. Better metrics are how enjoyable are the ultimate lives of our students and how much do students contribute to the welfare of their nation's citizens. These metrics are subjective and hard to measure. Most universities use the number and quality of research papers along with the amount of research funding, which are objective and easy uh, to measure. This raises the question, how do we evaluate our faculty? It is not how much research money they bring in or how many papers they publish. Instead, it should be, how much do they care about the success of students? How well do they teach? And what is their professional reputation as viewed by experts in their field? About five years ago, I chaired an international board advising the premier on how to improve education in China. At first, we wondered how we were going to review kindergarten, elementary school, high school, undergraduate, graduate, and adult education. Then we learned that our report was con constricted to be at most one page. So we focused on improving the quality of undergraduate education in China. Our key recommendation was to change the metrics by which universities were evaluated. Instead of focusing on the amount of research money and number of papers published, focus on the quality of teaching. 
And this required using subjective measures. We recommended having senior faculty members who were concerned with the quality of teaching sit in lectures and observe if the faculty member teaching a course was engaging the students and whether he was knowledgeable and excited about the material. They would also observe the fraction of students engaged with the lecture. We recommended faculty from a different university than the faculty member teaching the course to eliminate bias. Three lectures of each course should be evaluated, each lecture by a different individual, and the course given a score between one and five. The scores for each university would be averaged to give a university ranking. The Ministry of Education had many objective measures and was not comfortable using subjective measures. So they allowed me to evaluate computer science education at the top 40 universities in China. The evaluation technology required faculty sitting in classes and observing if the faculty member teaching the course was engaging the students and the fraction of students in, engaged in what was being taught. The evaluation is now in its fifth year of being carried out and is having a significant impact on the quality of education in China. University presidents were told if the quality of their institution's computer science teaching was in the top third, the middle third, or the bottom third. Department chairs were given the rankings of each of their faculty and into what third their department fell. The Ministry of Education uh, was supplied the full data. The project has had a major systemic impact on university education in China. Top universities get their budget from MOE and university presidents started to focus on improving undergraduate education. University presidents have five-year terms and at most two terms. When completing their term, they're assigned a new position depending on their performance. Since they are now likely to be evaluated on the university's quality of teaching, instead of on research funding and number of papers published, uh, this likely contributed to the change of university's focus on teaching quality. Many individuals have asked me what my strategy was that led to receiving the Turing Award. When I thought about it, I realized I had no formal strategy. I just did what I found interesting and exciting. I've talked to many Nobel Prize winners and Turing Award winners and asked them what strategy they used. Every one of them told me they had no strategy. If an opportunity to do something came along and it was exciting, they took it. Otherwise, they ignored it. Too many random things are gonna happen during your life that a strategy may not be useful uh, except to determine where you're going to eat and sleep. I will tell you a little bit about my career and show you how it was driven by random opportunities. I grew up in Seattle and did my undergraduate education at Seattle University in a small, unaccredited engineering college. I had planned to get my PhD at the University of Washington but a faculty member there told me that I would not be admitted since I was getting my degree at an unaccredited college. I spoke to my department chair and he said, why not apply to Stanford? I had never thought of Stanford, but decided to apply and was admitted. On getting my PhD, I planned to return to Seattle and get a faculty position at my undergraduate institution. I was walking by my advisor's office when he told me to come in. He was talking on the telephone to Ed McCluskey at Princeton, who was recruiting new faculty interested in computer science. Ed asked me to come to Princeton for an interview. I was offered a job and it changed my career from returning to Seattle to moving back east to Princeton. At Princeton, I was asked to develop a course on computer science. There were no such courses as computer science had not yet evolved. My degrees were actually in electrical engineering. I had to ask, what does one cover in such a course? 
And Ed gave me four research papers and said, cover these and it will be a good course. When I finished the course, Jeff Ullman, one of my students, and I converted my notes to the book Formal Languages and Their Relation to Automata. At this time, faculty at many universities started creating computer science courses. And since our book was the only material available, the book was used throughout the world. This led to my being viewed as a leading computer scientist, but it was purely an accident that I taught the course at the right time when computer science was being created. Since I was a senior uh, computer science researcher at an early age, I got many important assignments. Uh, if, if I was in an established field such as high energy physics, I would still be waiting today for the senior faculty ahead of me to retire. <laughs> uh, your lives will have just as many random events. If when an opportunity arises, you assess whether you would enjoy it, and if so, you take the opportunity, you will have a good career. Coming back to research and the opportunity to explore issues that you are curious about, I'd like to talk a little about how to determine what you really will enjoy. If as a child, you like to play with blocks and build things, maybe you would enjoy a career in manufacturing. If there was a woods with a path and you explored where the path went, maybe you would enjoy a career in research. If you enjoyed playing with other children, maybe you want a career in education or medicine. Clearly, what you enjoy will change as you get older, so it's important to continuously be curious about items. When I told students you get one life to live and you should enjoy it, I started to get questions like, how do I discover what I enjoy? I, I had thought everyone knew what they enjoyed, and I had no idea how to answer. Similarly, I was asked questions like, how do I increase my curiosity? Uh, th these are important questions, and I need to reflect on how I could answer them. Uh, have you heard that China has created a project to significantly improve undergraduate education? I will spend a few minutes discussing the project the Minister of Education in China created to improve computer science education at the top 33 universities in China. This project has become known as Project 101. PKU's president is in charge of it, and he has assigned individuals to execute the plan. If it's successful, it will be extended to other domains and more institutions. It's a very ambitious and important project. It consists of two major components. The first is to determine the key courses in computer science and develop the content and teaching material for them. The second component of Project 101 is to improve the quality of teaching and focuses on helping faculty improve teaching. The first component of the project, the, the 33 universities selected 12 key courses in computer science. Each course was assigned to one of the universities to develop content for the course. The individual at the university responsible for developing the content for an assigned course formed a team of top 10 to 20 faculty in the area of the course to work on developing the content and teaching material. The component might actually improve computer science education at all 1,500 universities in China. It's important that these universities get access to this material as soon as possible. Uh, the material in Project 101 is being created by the top faculty in China and may not be the best level for lower-ranked institutions. This suggests creating material for lower-ranked institutions in appropriate disciplines. To do this, I need to explain the concept of a portfolio. So far, education has only made a minor entry into the information age. Individuals are trying just to translate old ways into the digital world. Eventually, education will discover fundamentally new ways to use the new technology. 
An example of a fundamentally new idea has occurred in Project 101. Faculty were asked to develop the content for key courses in computer science. They were told to develop 50 to 100 key concepts for each course and then write short material for each concept. <laughs> what initially happened uh, is, the, in, is the response slid back to the status quo. Faculty did not grasp that this is a new way to create material and translated the request to the way one would create material prior to the digital age. They interpreted the request as, write a book. For them, topics were section headings and short write-ups were the book sections. What is needed is a cultural change from today uh, to the information society. I will refer to what was wanted as a portfolio and compare the concepts of book and portfolio and illustrate why uh, the portfolio is fundamentally different and far more important. A book is developed by two or three co-authors and takes a year to create. The result is the best content the two or three faculty can create. A portfolio is developed by 30 or 40 faculty and takes only one or two weeks to create. Each faculty member submits all the topics that he feels are important for the course. The union of each faculty member's topics give 50 to 100 topics. Each faculty member is then assigned maybe three topics to develop in one or two pages. The result is the best content the 30 or 40 members can create instead of the best content two or three faculty can create. Uh, if a book and a portfolio, both on the internet, are made available to 1,500 universities in China, each might be used by 1,500 faculty. Some faculty will respond by pointing out some additional material that should be included and that some material is not well written and needs to be worked on. The book is unlikely to be updated and if updated will require another year's effort. The portfolio can be updated in a week or two. The additional material is simply adding additional topics and creating the short write-ups. Improving the write-up of some material involves only rewriting two or three pages of a separate document. Uh, subjects are continuously evolving with time and new material needs to be created. For the portfolio, this is easy. Create the new topics. Note if there are 1,500 using the material, the quality will be the best of 1,500 individuals working on it, not the quality of two or three individuals. One might ask each of the 1,500 universities to participate in a project to create the course content. The first step is to have each university designate an individual to be responsible for the activity at their institution. The next step is to have those individuals develop the list of disciplines to be included in the project. Next, the universities that wanted a discipline developed need to create the list of important courses uh, for that discipline. Each course is then assigned to a qualified faculty member at some university and the faculty member seeks 50 faculty teaching an existing version of the course. Each of these faculty submits a list of intellectual ideas that should be included. These lists are union to create a set of maybe 100 topics to include in the course. Each topic is assigned to a faculty member to develop two or three pages of material for the topic. Each faculty member would be assigned maybe three topics and the whole process should be completed within a month. The quality will be the best that 50 existing faculty can create. Uh, the portfolio is, is not a curriculum. It's just content for a course. Each faculty member teaching the course should select the content they wish to use and teach the course in the manner that they feel is appropriate for their institution. Uh, the second component of Project 101 is to improve the quality of teaching and focuses on helping faculty improve teaching. The methodology grew out of a project to evaluate teaching 
in which a faculty member sat in on a lecture and observed the interaction of the faculty member teaching the course with the students in the course. When, when, one, when evaluating teaching, one learns information that can help the professor teaching the course improve his teaching. This is key. Uh, let, let me illustrate uh, by, you, by telling you what I learned in evaluating one class. The faculty member was an outstanding young faculty member and, and was uh, teaching about 30 students. When she started, every student was engaged and listening carefully. About 30 minutes into the lecture, half of the students disengaged. And I wondered why. The faculty member had just put up a mathematical theorem and then spent 20 minutes proving the theorem. I talked to the faculty member after the lecture and told her what had happened. We discussed it for a while and concluded that maybe the students did not understand what the formal mathematical theorem said, and it might have been better if she had explained the theorem intuitively, why it was important and how it would be used. She could have then engaged the class in converting the intuitive form of the theorem to the mathematical theorem. Also, we discussed if it made sense to spend 20 minutes proving the theorem maybe just discuss the key steps that would be needed. Uh, this led uh, to discussing what we would like students to remember about the lecture six months from now. Uh, it's not the detailed formal proof. Uh, based on this experience, Project 101 is having faculty sit in on lectures and discuss how students interacted with what their teachers taught. The assumption is that the resulting discussion will lead to improved teaching. Note that there are two processes where a faculty member is sitting in on lectures. One is to evaluate the quality of teaching, and the other is to improve teaching. The two processes are fundamentally different. In evaluating teaching, the faculty member is often from a different university and has no relationship with the faculty member teaching the course. The faculty member sitting in on lectures to improve teaching actually is working with the faculty member teaching the course, and the two of them are a team. Together, they are responsible uh, for improving teaching. Project 101 has been evaluated and found very successful and is now being extended to other disciplines. Mathematics, physics, chemistry, biology, basic medical sciences, traditional Chinese medicine, economics, philosophy, etc. An important issue is to realize that one wants to educate all students. Consider a discipline such as mathematics. The faculty at the top 33 institutions may focus on high-level courses for pure math majors, not realizing that the overwhelming number of students taking math courses are not even math majors. Appropriate level courses need to be developed for the majority of students. Project 101 has continued to be very successful as it's expanded, but it's important to keep in mind what we're doing, improving education for all students, offering opportunity to all talent. Individuals often ask me why I'm helping China improve education rather than helping the U.S. improve education. One of the reasons is China has centrally organized and funded education. In the United States, each of the 50 states has its own university system. And there are also private independent universities such as MIT, Stanford, Cornell, and many others. Thus, there is no way to work with universities as a whole but would need to work with each one individually. Perhaps the best strategy to improve education in the US is to focus on either the first three years of a child's life or to focus on elementary school education. Elementary school education is even more distributed than university education. Each local community has its own school district and there are thousands of them. 
Each school district taxes its community and hires and funds teachers and controls what is taught. Uh, there is significant research establishing that the first three years environment strongly impacts a child's life. Basically, in the first three years, the brain learns how to learn. And a nurturing environment significantly improves a child's future life. Research falls into two categories. In the first category, researchers focused on an inner city and identified pregnant women. They divided the women into two groups. They would work with women in the first group as they gave birth and create an intellectual and stable environment for the first three years of the child's life. The women in the second group were left alone for a comparison group. Thirty years later, they compared the individuals in the two groups. Children in the first group had higher educational levels, better jobs, fewer had criminal records. The first three years had a significant statistical impact. I met a researcher in Beijing who was researching the impact of different environments. I told her it must be difficult to do research where one needs to wait 30 years to see the outcome of an experiment. She responded that was not how she was working. She was using mice as a proxy for humans. She would purchase 200 mice and divide them into two groups. The first group she placed in cages with intellectually rich environments. The second group was placed in ordinary cages. And after th three weeks, the two groups were combined in ordinary cages. Uh, after two years, the mice were tested on mazes and other activities. The mice in the first group clearly outperformed mice, the other mice, confirming that early life environment has a major impact. This is an experiment that anyone can do. I then asked her, <laughs> what was a good intellectual environment for a mouse? Uh, she sent me an image of a cage with an intellectually rich environment with each item labeled as to what skill it developed. Other researchers focused on how the brain develops and the various abilities uh, develop, how, when various abilities develop in the brain. They learned what contributes most uh, for the child's developing brain. Most important is the involvement and interaction of parents. Children in a two-parent environment statistically outperform children who spent their first three years in a single-parent environment. Also important are age-appropriate toys in year one, toys such as a simple block of wood where a child learns they can move the block even though the block is not part of them. In the second year, age-appropriate books are important. One I strongly recommend is the greatest word book ever. It's simply a book filled with pictures. I sat on a couch with one of my children next to me and went through the book pointing at pictures and saying, house, tree, cat, dog. Very soon, we went through the book, and my child said, house, tree, cat, dog, as I pointed at the figures. Uh, the book has just one picture of a fire engine. One day when we were out walking, my daughter spotted a fire engine and said, Dad, look, a fire engine. She learned from a single image. Focusing on elementary school education is very important. Once a child completes elementary school, their view of the world is formed and it's difficult to change. They often live in a community that has the same view and that reads and accesses news sources that confirm that view. Thus, what is taught in elementary school is important. What I was taught was not quite correct. For example, I was told that democracy was the best form of government. We should have been taught that there are many forms of government and each has advantages and disadvantages. A disadvantage of a democracy is that for a politician to get elected requires funding. Rich individuals and corporations 
contribute to the politicians and build relationships that help them shape laws to their advantage. When historical facts are taught, their explanations are often, often create misleading views of what occurred. For example, I was taught that as early US settlers moved west, American Indians attacked them. While factually correct, I did not understand that the settlers were moving west to acquire more of the Indians' land, and the Indians were trying to hold on to their land. To be a great country for all requires improving elementary school education. I will take a few moments uh, about how this could be accomplished. The process requires two components. Determine what and how material should be taught, and secondly, develop a strategy to get it well taught in a very decentralized system. To determine the material to be taught, one should approach professional organizations such as the National Academy of Science or the American Association of Arts and Sciences to get experts in each area. For example, the American Association of Arts and Sciences has elected the best historians as members. These historians could develop U.S. history as it actually occurred, not as it is currently being taught. Material in each area should be developed by experts knowledgeable about the material. Once the material is, is developed, getting it taught in elementary schools is the next task. To do this, one could publish the material in digital form on the internet where everyone would have access to it. Uh, some politicians uh, might not want it taught in schools they have control over, but the material would eventually filter into the district. Uh, civilization has undergone an agricultural revolution, an industrial revolution, and now is undergoing an information revolution. The revolutions are occurring more frequently and happening faster. Prior to the agricultural revolution, humans were simply hunter-gatherers, and the total population was small. While the agricultural revolution took thousands of years, its impact was tremendous. It increased food supply, which increased the total population, and created communities where individuals created small farms. The Industrial Revolution was much quicker and took only several hundred years. It created manufacturing jobs, automated agriculture, and improved the quality of life. The Information Revolution may only require a lifetime to complete. It is automating many jobs and will drastically change lives and lifestyles. It may produce goods and services so only a small fraction of the population will be needed. The information revolution will make many changes in our lives. Jobs will change from manufacturing to information processing. This will require creating high quality talent for the information age. In the past, what made nations great was oil, gold, or agriculture. In the future, it will be talent. This means that those nations that become great will be those that invest in education and make education one of their top priorities. AI will be an important component of the information age. Developing AI will require nations to develop talent that will require focusing on quality education. AI will be applied to agriculture, biology, medicine, manufacturing, and many other areas. It will be a major contributor to creating jobs, increasing a nation's gross national product, and improving the lives of citizens. Uh, research has become mathematically sophisticated and in the future will be even more sophisticated, requiring high, highly educated talent. One of the most important things a nation can do is to focus on improving education. 
I will now talk about the development of theoretical computer science over the past 50 years and future directions. The discipline of computer science started around 1964 when I graduated from Stanford and accepted a faculty position at Princeton in the electrical engineering department. At that time, courses in programming were taught, but most individuals did not realize uh, that a science of computing and its application would be developed. Ed McCluskey realized that more than computer programming should be taught and asked me to teach a course on theory related to computing. I had no idea what to teach in the course since there were no books or such courses at other universities. Ed gave me four research papers and told me if I covered them it would be a good course. I will begin by telling you about the material I covered. Uh, the first topic uh, was automa finite automata, a device that had inputs, outputs, and a finite number of states. The finite automaton was a mathematical, math mathematical model for a device such as the device that controls an elevator, uh, which keeps track of the floor the elevator was at, the direction it was going, and the requests it had to visit various floors. The mathematical model was made simple. Its input was just strings of zeros and ones, and its output was yes or no. Basically, it accepted a set of strings and the theory focused on what the set of strings could be accepted by a finite automaton. It was known then that there are different sizes of infinity. The number of finite automata is countably infinite, and the number of sets of strings is a higher size infinity. Thus, there are sets that cannot be accepted by a finite automaton. A set is called regular if there exists a finite automaton that accepts it. I spent several weeks of the course explaining regular sets. One of the research papers I was using introduced the concept of a non-deterministic finite automaton. A deterministic finite automaton is one in which for each state and input symbol, there is a unique next move. A non-deterministic finite automaton has several possible next moves. A string is accepted by a non-deterministic finite automaton if there exists a sequence of moves that led the finite automaton to an accepting state where the output is yes. To determine if a string uh, is not accepted, one needs to accept all possible sequences of moves. Non-determinism has become an important concept in computer science. To better understand non-determinism, Consider a non-deterministic algorithm to determine if an integer is composite. The algorithm guesses a divisor, divides, and determines if the integer is composite. If the integer is composite, there exists a guess that will divide the integer and verify that the integer is composite. Can we determine if an integer is not composite? That is, if an integer is prime? It appears that we would need to try every integer to see if it would divide the possible prime. One of the surprising facts about finite automata is that if a set of strings is accepted by a non-deterministic finite automaton, there exists a deterministic finite automata that also accepts the set of strings. The equivalent deterministic finite automaton has a state corresponding to each of the set of states of the non-deterministic finite automaton. And this raises the question if for other models, deterministic and non-deterministic have the same power. I, I notice that um, I'm, I've used up an, an hour. And I'm, I'm not sure that the material on uh, theoretical computer science is going to be interesting to most people. So let me make a proposal. Is it possible to take my slides and put them on a website here? Then anybody who wants to read the material on uh, theoretical computer science can do it. And anybody who wants the first part of the talk can, can see it. Uh, and there are just some interesting uh, things, uh, like chat GPT. Uh, what, what they have done 
uh, is they've taken all of the information that's on the internet, but it was too much to store. So they tried to compress it. But if they compressed it losslessly, it still was too much. So they said, we will compress it loss, lossly. And what this does is it keeps the essence of, of the material, but throws away details. And so the language models, um, you can ask them to create a paper or an obituary or a poem or a computer program, and it will sort of do it. it you could even ask to get your obituary, and it will write it. And what it will tell you is that you are survived by your, your two daughters and a son, and it will give their names and so on. Uh, some of this information is not going to be quite correct. That kind of information has been thrown away. But it's a, sort of a search engine which pulls out the essence of things. And, and, and that's in here. I included it because I think it's important for universities to figure out what kind of research they could do with chat GPT. Because even major corporations don't have the power to reduce all of the information. So you have to find things which are doable in a, a reasonable amount of time. But with that, I'm going to stop. And I'm happy to answer any, any questions that people have. Thank you so much for your introduction in the uh, computation theory. And uh, I will also link that to also especially the non-determinism in the computation theory to another hot topic that is the quantum computation. Let's say uh, they have probabilistic uh, computation results. So uh, how would you predict the application or the evolution of, say, traditional um, computation theory in the quantum computation age? Right. Uh, re researchers in this area don't think there will be enough qubits available for a general purpose computer in the foreseeable future. Uh, so what they have done um, is they have adopted something that people in, in uh, normal computing have done. Moore, Moore's law, which said that the number of transistors on a chip would double every year and thereby uh, increase the computing power, has come to an end because you can't make the wires smaller and smaller. And so the question is, is how to make computers faster? And one of the strategies has been, instead of building general purpose computers, build special purpose computers. And uh, one of them uh, is the graphical processing unit. Uh, this is a, a computer that the only thing it will do is multiply two vectors together. Uh, and it will do this extremely fast. And the reason this is important is in graphics, almost all of the computation is multiplying vectors together. And so you attach this special purpose computer to a general computer and do things much faster. And in fact, um, for those of you that are interested in deep learning, what allowed them to train AlexNet was using a couple of these graphical processing units. But what people in quantum computing realize, they can't build a general purpose computer in the foreseeable future. So they are focusing now on building special purpose computers. Uh, particularly, they'd like to build a computer where the only thing it does uh, is determine if an integer is a prime because this is very important for uh, cryptography and things like that. But I don't know that anybody is thinking about non-determinism yet. Uh, for the, if you're interested in quantum computing, uh, in Project 101, I, I wanted to convince them that to build a portfolio takes only three weeks. So I picked a topic, and what I picked was quantum. And I found the top 25 faculty in China. It took me a week, but as I found them, I asked them if they agreed to help me to send me what they thought were the things that should go into quantum. And at the end of a week, I had a list of 100 topics. I then assigned two or three topics to each faculty member, 
and ask them in the next two weeks to create the material, and they did. I don't have the link right with me, but if you're interested in it, uh, this is a course in quantum, and it's called just quantum because uh, there's quantum communication and quantum uh, uh, computing, and this is the basic material you'd need for either course, and it's developed by the top 25 faculty in China. Uh, somehow, we'll try to get that link. Uh, if you can get a hold of Project 101, you can find it. Uh, but thank you for the question. It was a good question. Thank you for answering. So, so we'll, uh, we'll work uh, with our uh, communications folks so that we can, uh, after, after today, uh, add a number of links uh, to things that you believe uh, this audience might be interested in, including your slides. So yeah. thank you. Thank you. Uh, next question. Maybe right here. Oh, hello, and uh, thanks for the great talk. So I'm Hong Yi Wen. I'm actually um, an assistant professor in computer science. I'm also a uh, graduate from Cornell. So nice to see you here in Shanghai. Uh, so I'm also working in actually this area called AI for education. But I, what I'm wondering these days is like, uh, what, what are we really meaning when we talk about AI for education? And then I come to this idea of Maybe we should do, as a computer scientist, maybe we should do AI for educators, which means we will create tools, such as using ChatGPT and all these like, great tools to help facilitate the teaching process. And that's exactly like aligned with uh, the first part of the talk, which great experience you share with some experiments with both Chinese and uh, US universities. So I'm wondering, maybe here comes to my question. So I'm wondering, how do you think of these generative AI tools and most recent advances in AI, uh, and those helps the teaching process at scale. So, and what do you think like the human plays a part in this uh, process as, as uh, together with uh, these AI tools? So the, the question is about uh, generative AI for educators. How is it that uh, educators uh, might uh, make use of these new tools in order to be more effective in doing the kind of teaching that you described earlier? To be more effective in? In teaching. Uh, uh, so, so uh, our, our, you know, you could you could use ChatGPT, uh, or you could use a different LLM. Uh, might it be possible for us to use these new tools to be better at the work of teaching? Right. That's the question. Uh, that, that, that's a good question. Um, one of the things people who study uh, what makes a good faculty member. Uh, it turns out is not how well they speak or how knowledgeable they are and things like this, but it's whether they care about the success of their students. Um, and the reason I bring this up is, uh, well, maybe 10 years ago, people asked, uh, we're going to have digital courses. Um, isn't this going to be great? And it may have been very helpful for China initially, where they didn't have the content. But the trouble with digital courses is you just threw away uh, the thing which is most important <laughs> uh, in the teaching, namely the relationship between the faculty member and the student. So whether AI, uh, people are probably going to figure out how to use AI to do something in teaching. But I'm just not convinced that it's going to improve the quality of education. Um, and I'm going to come back to what's really important is the high-level skills that students learn. It's, it's not the technical material. Uh, when I discovered that in the technical courses that I was teaching, that if I asked a student 10 years later, what, what did they use, <laughs> they said nothing. <laughs> I realized it's, it's not the technical content. Uh, it's important that we teach the technical content for some reason. Uh, but somehow when we're teaching that, we're teaching people higher level skills in an indirect way, which I, I don't understand. Um, but so these questions, how is AI going to in, improve teaching? Uh, I, I'm not convinced it is going to. And by, by the way, I can only think of two technologies that have helped teaching. Uh, one of them is the printing press, because it made material available. Uh, and, and the other is the blackboard. 
uh, because it allowed a faculty member to teach 20 students rather than with his little disc teach two students. But of all the technology that has come along, uh, I, I can't really identify technology that has improved education. So if I could just ask a, a quick follow-up on that. Um, I'll, I'll seize the prerogative of the microphone. Um, what about, and some people have suggested this, that some new AI tools uh, might, if properly uh, developed, uh, enable more personalized learning uh, when it comes to uh, engaging with uh, relatively simple uh, material. Uh, so that a, stu a student who is trying to use a digital uh, education system to absorb knowledge or acquire particular skills uh, could, with the help of AI, uh, discover where they're having trouble uh, and, 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 develop, and, and, and work their way through their trouble uh, in a way that's hard to do in a big classroom uh, yeah. for a teacher to sort of understand where each individual student is. Might AI be helpful in, in that in that setting? Well, no, it, it's certainly uh, possible. And it, it's important, if, if you find AI exciting to be included in education, uh, you ought to work on it, because it may turn out that I could be completely wrong, and it may be a very important uh, advance. Um, and there, there may be ways, in special ways, um, but, um, Things like the search engine have changed education. Um, it no longer makes sense to uh, teach facts. If you want facts, you, you can get them from a search engine. Uh, so now, somehow I think, if, for example, if you're gonna teach history, you don't just teach that a war occurred, uh, but you teach what, what were the events that caused this war to happen, and what were the consequences of after of this war. Uh, so our teaching is going to have to become much more sophisticated uh, and we do away with just knowledge. We're not teaching knowledge anymore. Thank you. Uh, next question, please. Uh, we have one down here. Thank you very much, sir, for coming here today. Um, my question is pretty simple. Since you're designing one of the basic algorithms and data structures, which one is your favorite? Um, which data structure and which algorithm would you pick? Which one is your favorite and why? So do you have a favorite data structure, a favorite algorithm that, uh, that, that just brings joy to your, to, to your life? And why? <laughs> uh, well, I, I used to really enjoy uh, algorithms like uh, sorting, to simply divide and conquer. Uh, and, and during, I should point out that during my lifetime, uh, there were simple mathematical algorithms that an individual could develop and write a paper about and enjoy doing. But the world has changed. The problems are so much bigger today uh, that you can't even prove that an algorithm is correct. And I'll, I'll, see, if you have a simple mathematical problem, you can prove that your algorithm solves it. But what if I want an algorithm to drive an automobile? What does it mean to prove that's correct? I can't even tell you in any detail what it does. The, 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 the algorithms today are so much more complicated and sophisticated, and they're of an entirely different nature. Um, and I don't know if researchers today are going to have their favorite among them. <laughs> Is there a particular kind of sort that, that you especially love? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, next question, next question. I see a hand way up there in the back. Can we bring a microphone? We have a speedy microphone delivery person here. Thank you very much. Hi, thank you for being here. So I'm a computer science student and oftentimes I find myself just studying for a test because our uh, semesters are so rigorous with testing. I don't like usually, and it's, Probably true for most of my class fellows too. We only aim to like get a good grade on the test in comparison to truly like immersing ourselves in the material and reflecting on it and developing on that. So how do you think like this um, sort of problem can be fixed through uh, teaching where 
we explore the major more, the courses more, instead of just focusing on our tests. Thank you. So the, the, the question is actually about uh, actually what universities have done, but even the larger society has done, which is to encourage students uh, to be instrumentally focused on grades and on uh, studying a subject in order to achieve a very limited outcome rather than uh, developing the kind of curiosity uh, that you right. were talking about earlier. Uh, is there a way to fix this? Is there a way for us to get back uh, to the kind of study for the joy of inquiry and curiosity right. uh, in a world where there's so much pressure uh, to focus on grades? Yeah, you, you've raised a, a very important question uh, because we're in a situation uh, where the metrics are wrong. If, if you, let's say, you're going to graduate and then want to go to a U.S. university uh, to get a Ph.D., you better publish some papers or they won't even look at your application. Uh, so you have to do some things which simply don't make sense, uh, but you can't avoid them. <laughs> Uh, so the question about how do we get convert university education back uh, to where you can really be curious about things and explore what you want to explore and um, not have to have a certain grade point or uh, other things. And it, it's really a bind. Uh, I, 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 I guess you're going to have to have two strategies. Uh, one, you're going to take some of your time to do what you really enjoy and to really learn and get an education. But you're going to have to take some of your time to do things which don't make any sense and you may not enjoy. And I don't know how we're going to get away from that. Uh, but but it, it's, a, it's a major problem. Uh, yeah, and, and also, see, I noticed particularly in China, for Asian students, their parents want them to major in computer science because it's going to get them a high-paying job. And what, what if the student is really interested in music? Or what if they're interested in, you know, other, other things? Um, and I'll go back to the one statement that I'd like to leave you with. The purpose of an education is to help you have a good life and find, to find some way that you can really major in what you enjoy rather than what our society says you ought to major in. It comes back to your question up there. Uh, somehow metrics are just wrong and I, I don't know how we can change them. I think uh, that is a magnificent point on which to end today's session. I, I, I just wanna, uh, unless there's, there are one or two more questions that people have. Oh, oh, we do, right here, so. Thank you, sir, for being here today. Um, I just wanted to prove like, um, non-CS students are also here today to hear about the education aspect. And um, I wanted to ask about the portfolio you proposed, like, um, because I noticed that you um, evaluated um, the quality of the portfolio in a quantitative way that um, p uh, more people's wisdom is like, um, mm, proves to be like more valuable than um, people who did not like um, have more people participating in the writing of the books. And I feel like um, it doesn't make sense to me because like um, when two or three authors collaborate on a book, um, they have this um, collaboration flow, they have this coherence in the books that um, it um, kind of motivates the student to do a kind of systematic thinking. But if you like, um, divide it into like 40 or 50 people, it kind of fractures the way that they're thinking. So I'm not sure about like the idea of the portfolio. Can you answer the question for me? So the, this is a challenge to the, the portfolio model. Uh, the, the, the point that the questioner is asking is when you are in the, looking at a book, uh, what you're encountering as a student 
um, is a mind, or maybe two minds. The mind of the author, that mind has organized the entire subject in a coherent way, and as a student, you are engaging continuously with that mind uh, throughout the entire experience of the subject. With a portfolio, when you've got large numbers, 40 or 50 different minds, with very different attitudes, different impulses, different senses of what is a good concept or what, if, what is a bad concept, isn't it possible that the portfolio that the student encounters is a mess uh, and, and is just a jumble that reflects quantity rather than quality? What's your response to that? No, that, that's an important point because when we thought of the portfolio, we thought of it as providing content for faculty to teach. We, we didn't think of it as providing learning material for students. And it, it, might, it might be that it simply is not good for the students at all. That somehow you've got to then take that content and say, how do we present this in a coherent fashion so that when the student reads it, they'll get something from it? Uh, so I, I think that's going to be one of the negative things about the portfolio. It, it's probably not going to help the student. So the point is well taken. Um, maybe time for, our, yes, I see someone holding a microphone right there, yes. Um, thank you, thanks a lot for your talk. Um, what I want to say is that any problem that I've ever worked on, um, someone out there has known the answer. I could have always asked my professors or the internet for the answer. So I've never worked on something that's never been done before. I've never been on the edge of the known and the unknown. So what does it feel like for you being on that edge of the known and the unknown? And um, how do you gain the confidence to be on that edge when there's no one else who could answer your questions and you're the only one doing it? So uh, that's a, 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 a wonderful question. Um, and and, and the, the questioner's uh, uh, assumption is that uh, now we're in a world where there's a lot, of, a lot of stuff that's known. And a lot of what we are doing when we're studying the world is actually not blazing a new trail. We're not producing the first computer science course uh, or something like that. And uh, as you have described it, you have been, had the good fortune uh, to live out on, on this edge between the known and the unknown, and you have uh, felt comfortable going forward into the unknown uh, and, and enjoyed it. And I guess I would break this point or this question into two questions. Um, is there still, first, is there still a decent amount of unknown stuff left uh, for people who are curious and want to explore? Uh, and how would you find uh, that unknown stuff and then second, uh, once you found an area where there seems to be a fair amount of unknown stuff left, uh, what does it feel like? Uh, how do you have the courage to sort of just go out there uh, and, and, and poke around and explore? Yeah, uh, so I guess the world really has changed in that way. Um, when I was even in elementary school, uh, there, there was unknown things that were at a level that the elementary school child could study. Uh, but today, uh, things are, so much is known um, that what's not known is so complex and it's not clear that it's going to be that relevant to anything in life. Uh, a good example is Newton's laws. Uh, for, for the world that we live in, Newton's laws are correct. Uh, for the speed that we move, or things like that. But if you start moving close to the speed of light, or if you start moving mass around in the universe, uh, Newton's laws no longer are fully correct. But, uh, so there's something there to explore, and many physicists are exploring. But it's not, doesn't have the same feel that you're going to discover something uh, that people you know are going to be interested in. 
only other researchers, probably. And, and these are important things to learn. Um, but um, there, I have focused on science, and it may be that in science we've pushed ourselves to the edge, but maybe in other areas like sociology and so forth, there may be very simple things we still have to understand. Um, I mean, when you look at the, the difficulties we're having in the world today and ask, you know, how can we solve these? Uh, and um, the, it turns out that the population of most countries is starting to decline. Uh, in the U.S., it's not because of immigration. Uh, and the same with Europe, but uh, Japan and South Korea. Um, and it turns out our economies were built on uh, an expanding society. And they may have changed fundamentally. And so there, there may be very simple things. So in areas away from just the physical sciences and mathematical sciences, um, it may be that the world is not as bleak as I may have led you to believe. Please join me in thanking Professor Hofcroft for an amazing, amazing lecture. I will sign this today. Thank you, everyone. This concludes our event. Thank you for joining us today.